let's go ahead and have our panel. You guys can come on up here. We're gonna have Brother Nathan Letman, the P7 coordinator. Woohoo! <laughs> Brother William Spriggs, he's the P7 leader at Antioch. And Brother Hector Robles, our main speaker. Praise God. So, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to ask these questions and then you guys feel free to chime in uh, at any point. I may toss one to you first. You know, if somebody specific I might toss you first, but all of you are welcome to respond. You guys had a good time today? Yes. Good, good. Praise God. But you're going to find out the exact total of who won. I have an inkling that it's the CMIers, but we'll see. Uh, you'll find out after the Q&A, so be prepared. If CMIers, if you win, you better lose your mind. Good, good. Praise God. All right, let's jump into this. The first question is, it seems so hard to witness to people that think they are already saved. How do you share the truth with them without, seem, without seeming condescending or condemning? Great question. One of the best questions we've ever had in these panels. That's very good. So, dealing with somebody who already knows the truth, or excuse me, they think they have truth, how do you share it without condemning them? I saw this happen with my own mother. So, uh, it's a very sensitive situation you can imagine. Uh, respect. That's the very short version of the answer. Respect helps people's faith to when you respect somebody it helps them to know that they're acknowledged and it brings their guard down when you show disrespect or lack of acknowledgement you don't have to affirm false doctrine to show respect but acknowledging somebody's faith and relationship with God brings their guard down they're already possibly expecting you to combat Respect will uh, is one of the forms of love, and it'll help bring their guard down. And uh, recently saw this was a pre with the Presbyterian. I've seen it happen with Catholics. I've seen it happen with uh, people of different denominations that thought they were saved. And so you can always say God has more for you. And just don't make a big deal about it, too. If they say, well, I'm saved. I, I, real quick story, really quick. Uh, there was a guy... He had a Baptist background. He talked. It's like it built into a lot of their language. Like, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Long story short, I talked to him about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he's like, well, I'm saved already. Why would I need it? I said, but he saw the revelation of the apostles receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and how people could receive it today. But he said he was saved. I said, just go home and pray about it. Three weeks later, he calls me. He says, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. He said, I was praying in my house this afternoon, and uh, something started happening to me while I was praying. Long story short, <laughs> he, he, start, he says that he started speaking words he did not understand, sounds that he did not understand. He pulls out Google Translate on his phone, <laughs> and Google Translate pulls up, the language is Hebrew. And the words that he was speaking were, Father, your spirit dwells within me. Oh. It's a true story. He's a buddy of mine. He just texted me a few days ago. God's doing a mighty work in his life. They just had a miscarriage a few months ago, but God has given a miracle to their second baby now, third baby. And, uh, but respect gave me uh, the ability to walk through the door that his heart was already open to. That's uh, test all we need. Um, I think just to tag on and, and add to that, um, something that I found in in the high schools is that I think sometimes we spend too much time trying to prove the person wrong when we know that they're not believing what we believe, and so all of our energy goes into all right. Every scripture I'm going to use is going to be used to prove you wrong, and that's all about my pride, my ego. That's there's no spirit there. So we need to spend more time just proving God right. That's all controlled by God. So an example of that is um, 
there was this Catholic girl I was doing a Bible study with. She was convinced the Trinity, that's it. That's, that's the truth. My, I, I've, as I know, there's one God. Easily, I could have spent my whole, all my energy yeah. in making her say, there's one God. I'm going to prove you wrong. But instead, I just said, well, let's look at that. Let's look at what you believe. Let's break down the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the names of it. Let's see what the Word of God says. And instead of proving her wrong, I just wanted to prove God right. And she then, by the end of it, the Word did the work, the Spirit did the work, and she was like, wow, I see what, you, I see what you're saying. There is one God. There was no debate. There was no, I'm going to prove you wrong. You're going to know I'm right. So when you're dealing with somebody that doesn't believe the same thing as you, believes they're already saved, you may know, okay, you're not saved, but do not spend all your energy proving them wrong. You're going to get in debates, arguments, and you're going to achieve nothing. Um, and just just to add a little bit to that, so like you said, never go toe to toe. It it never really works out that oh yeah I won I proved them wrong. Um, nobody really ends up a winner when you do that. But the Bible, what I've found, and throughout my college experience in having a CMI on our campus, most of the the confrontation were from other Christians that uh, believe we don't have to do all of that. Um, and so the Bible is the great equalizer, right? That's the standard. At the end of the day, it's not my opinion, and it's not your opinion. It's the word of God that's the truth. And, you know, if you're right, I want to know that, and I want to live by that. And if, you know, if what I what I understand the word of God to say is correct, then, you know, we should all live to that standard. Um, and so you just meet at the word on equal ground. Um, and so just to throw some stuff out there in terms of, so, okay, if, if they are genuinely hungry and they genuinely want to know, is what you're saying true or is what I believe already true? Um, some scriptures you can go to is uh, Acts chapter 10. Actually, Acts has a ton of amazing examples uh, with Cornelius, right? And he's, the Bible says that he prayed to God. He feared God with all his house. He prayed to God always. He gave alms like continually. I mean, he lived the Christian life, you know, believing God. But that wasn't enough. And that's the whole story in terms of Yes, he was a believer. Yes, he, you know, was doing everything he knew to do. Yes, he was pleasing to God, but there was a little bit more that he needed to do. And that's why, if you know the story, uh, through the interaction of Angel and then Cornelius sending some servants to go get Peter, bring him over. And in the middle of Peter preaching to Cornelius and his whole house, they all received the Holy Ghost. And this is a great scripture for the evidence of tongues because it says, for they heard them speak with other tongues and magnify God. That's how they recognized, oh, they got the Holy Ghost. And then Peter was like, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? And so there's some certain denominations that believe, oh, once you're baptized, you, you receive the Spirit at the same time. But there's a lot of examples in the Bible where it's, it's two separate events that take place. So Acts chapter 10 is a go-to. And then Acts chapter 11, Peter, first of all, he's shocked. He's like, I thought this was only for Jews. This didn't make sense that they had the same exact experience we did. And he went back to the council in Jerusalem, is letting them know. And he says, I went to tell them what they needed to do to be saved. It says to be saved. So is it okay to, is it possible to be a believer, to be a Christian, to love God with all your heart and not experience the salvation according to the Bible, the answer is yes, um, without that. Another scripture you can go to is Acts chapter 19 uh, and they run into, Paul runs into believers. Mind you, they're believers, that means they are doing everything they know to do to serve and live for God. And he said, 
awesome. So did you guys receive the Holy Ghost too? He's like, we haven't even heard of the existence of a receive the Holy Ghost. What is that? And Paul broke it down, and they, he laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And then he asked them as well, have you been baptized? And they were said, well, we were baptized unto John's baptism, referring to John the Baptist. They're like, well, that's good. That covers repentance. But now you can get baptized for the remission of your sins. And he had them be rebaptized again. And so uh, there's a lot of scriptures you can go to uh, to show there can always be another place for salvation that we need to go to as believers. You guys just got a wealth of wisdom. <laughs> Some great stuff. The only thing I'll add really quick is if we really believe that uh, life starts at conception, that means we believe that life happens before you come out of the womb. If you tie that parallel to a sp the spiritual sense, that means people can be in the womb hearing God's voice feeling God's presence because the baby can feel and hear in the womb before it ever comes out but it's still not born yet so you got to treat people like the next step is for them to have more not for them to oh you don't know anything you don't have anything right that's how you that's how you create abortions that's how you kill babies that are in the womb that are about to be born and we don't believe in abortion do we no, because life starts at conception. So you need to treat people like that with respect, that they're just on their way and they just haven't come out of the womb yet yep. and haven't taken their first breath yet, but they're growing and they're learning, but they still need to be born. We need to be born again of water and spirit. So treat people with respect and show them that it's just the next step. They need more. Amen. Let's go to this next question says, <clears throat> how do you overcome fear? Because I am really scared to start a P7 in middle school. How do you overcome fear? Great question. Um, that, that's, a, that's a super, super good question. Um, I feel like one thing that we, we have to know is that most of the time, the thing that you're afraid of the exact opposite is most of the time going to happen, okay? So I'll use an example f of myself. I was terrified of starting a P7 club because I was convinced that everybody that I was friends with was not going to be my friend anymore and they're going to make fun of me. I was convinced I was going to be a lone loner, loser in the corner and everybody was going to hate me and I was convinced that the P7 was going to fail, okay? Those are the three biggest fears that for years I did not do a P7 because of it. And then I go out and I, I finally just step out because at the end of the day, that's an assumption. There's no fact there. It's just an assumption. And I step out and I end up gaining more friends than what I had before. I gained respect from teachers and administration that I didn't have before. I was now, I got connected with more and more people. And the last one, and this is huge, I feel like we need to hear this really quickly. Failure in a P7 or a CMI, it, it is, it's, it's not even a real concept because I have no control over a result, okay? The only thing that counts as a failure is if I don't obey, okay? But if God says, go talk to 10 people and zero people show up to my P7 club, I succeeded. I obey the voice of God. If God says pray for this person and they just look at me and say thanks and walk away, that's a success. It, we get so caught up in the fear of failure when failing is really, really, really hard in, in reality. Results have nothing to do with failure. Results have nothing to do with success. Obedience is the only thing that matters in that. So when you get that in your mindset, a big chunk of your fear is taken away, right right then and there. When you realize, wow, all I have to do is obey. It doesn't matter if the P7 has a 1,000 people or one. It doesn't matter if this or that. It's just about obedience. Well, that, th that takes a big chunk of fear away. I can obey. And then realizing that nine, most of the time you're going to feel a lot of fear. The devil's going to throw a lot of intimidation at you. Uh, Brother Mike has talked about it. Th it's a smaller version. It's a smaller scale 
of the spirit that attacks community colleges, which is that intimidation. And, and when you really think about it, intimidation's a bluff, okay? So the devil's gonna bluff and bluff and bluff and try to get you to believe the bluff. If you just step, you'll realize, man, th this, there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no power. The, the devil has no power over me. The things I was worried about happening isn't even happening. Because in reality, most of the time, the exact opposite's gonna happen. So when you feel that fear, when you feel those different things, you just say, Lord, you are truth. Your word is truth. I know that results aren't on me. It's on you. So you know what, God? I'm not going to think about the failure. I'm not going to think about those things. I'm just going to trust your word and walk. And as you walk step by step, start small. Go talk to your friend, one friend, and then talk to two friends. And then ask, great, maybe do you want to do a Bible study? Okay, well, hey, I, I'm doing this club, P7 club. Do you want to come to it? And just gradually build, and every time you step, you'll realize the thing you're afraid of wasn't even there. It's a bluff. Um, the only thing I'll add to that is the Bible says that perfect love casteth out all fear. And we have to recognize within ourselves at a certain point, my love for my school and for my classmates has to outweigh my own personal em embarrassment or how am I going to look, and which it feels like fear, but it, it kind of comes from pride because we're kind of concerned about ourselves and how we're going to come off. Um, and so it's, you know, Allow you, God in, in your prayer, God, give me the love to, to outweigh my fear. And then two, just take it step by step. Typically, the fear isn't about the next thing that you're supposed to do. It's about what could happen down. So I'm scared of, the say, the first P7, and I have a ton of people there. Then I'm like, oh, man, now everybody's looking at me. But the next step is just to go to your administration and say, hey, I'd like to start a P7. So don't think about the first session yet. Just focus on, all right, I can just do this next step. I, I'm comfortable. I can talk to my vice principal or whoever's in charge of starting clubs um, or campus, uh, you know, yeah. So, um, so just do the next step. And after that, you know, I'm scared to even talk to my closest friends about starting a P7 or, you know, just I can at least put in a morning announcement. So when all the announcements are read or put up for my school, then uh, they'll read it for me. Okay, you did the next thing that I can handle. And you just do it step by step. Fear typically lands somewhere in tomorrow or next week. It's not in the right now. And so um, just trust God and allow the love to, to propel you through that fear. Very good stuff. Uh, you'll be shocked. A whole lot more people will respect you than reject you. You're always going to have some people that will reject you, but our fear is that everybody will reject us. That's not, there's hungry people. And actually, there's a lot of people that will respect you because they realize you have a backbone they don't have. So they're looking for people that are willing to stand for something even if, you don't, if they don't agree with you. A whole lot more people will respect you than reject you. Amen. And can I say one more thing to that individual, whoever wrote that? I just want to let you know that we've been praying for you. We've been wanting to see more middle school P7s. Yes. And so if you're in middle school and you're ready to start a P7, yeah. you're an answer to our prayers yeah. that we've been putting up to see more middle school P7 clubs. Yeah. So... Follow that. That's God leading you. That's powerful. Very good. Very good. Let's go to this next question. We're going to stay sort of in the vein of fear, but we're talking more so about complications with the red tape administration. So it says, what if you were only able to do P7 once a month or once every two months because of the school policy. 
I'm going to start before you guys, and then I'll toss it to you guys. First thing I'll say is, why does the school policy have to dictate how you do ministry? If your mind, is, if your focus on doing the, the ministry is only on the fact that you can use a classroom when they tell you to, then you're limiting God. Because God wants you to do ministry all the time, out of the classroom, in the classroom, outside of school, inside school. Don't think that CMI or P7 is just this thing that you do if it's a club and if it's during the school day or in the classroom. That P7 is just ministry. You're ministering in the high school. Personal Bible studies, get out your Bible in the lunchroom and start teaching a Bible study. The administration doesn't need to tell you anything about that. While you're eating lunch, pull out your Bible. That's P7. <laughs> while, while you're walking to class, tell someone about Jesus. That's P7. <laughs> while you're uh, on a break or you're sitting right outside the class, right outside the building, waiting for your parents to pick you up from the from the uh, from school, lift up your voice and start singing. That's P7. Why do we think P7 and CMI is just sitting in a classroom and ta and talking about the Bible uh, for an hour once a week? That's what the enemy wants you to think. But true ministry in a P7 CMI is when you are opening your mouth at all times. You guys have anything else? I was going to say really quickly, um, I think a, a big thing is that... And, Um, yeah, you know, the, the other thing is that, you know, th those battles that you're fighting are, you got to do it in the spirit as well. You know, there were some, there were some things that, that, that prevented Old Mill P7 from happening, um, where it got shut down like four or five times, just over and over and over. Because the bigger the club grew, they kept on saying, well, you need to add, our policy says you need to add another teacher sponsor. And it's impossible to find another teacher sponsor in the middle of a school year. And at first, I wanted to just argue and argue and argue with the administration, argue with the principal, argue with the teacher, try to just beg them to, to change the policy. But I just instead just have to understand that we have to take that to prayer. You know, we're, you know, we're, not, we're not battling, you know, flesh and blood, okay? So, so I got a hand. I, it would be foolish to start in the spirit and finish it in the flesh, so I need to finish it in the spirit. So go to prayer. But, but like, like what Mike was saying, that's exactly it, though. P7 is a lifestyle. It, it's not the club meeting. And sometimes we think, well, we don't have a club. How are we going to get posted on the Instagram? How are we going to this? How are we going to that? It's not about that. As long as you can talk to one person, talk to two people, your P7 is thriving. Just obey God. But if it comes to the administration or them could, getting in the way and, and telling you you need to cancel this or shut that down, don't go and start arguing in the flesh. Take it to prayer. Start, start praying and asking God, look, God, we, are, we need to do this. Revival's here. I believe in your name that you've called me to this school. You've called me to do these things. And we're not about to let flesh and blood get in the way of what the Spirit is trying to do. When you do that, you'll see a change. They shut us down, and then I went to prayer. And then next thing you know, they said, one teacher sponsor's fine. Go ahead, keep going. Not because of me, but because God does that. It, it's, it's much deeper than flesh and blood. I'm going to tell two quick stories, if that's okay. And then, Nate, did you want to tag on? I was going to say, for P7, you also, if it ever got to that, if there, it was truly injustice happening, um, P7 nationally does have legal assistance. If you need it, you can call them up. Because we have a right to free speech. We have a right to talk about Jesus in the classroom. They try to shut it down. We can fight it. We have a right. But I want to mention this real quick. Two quick stories. RP7s at one point did a bunch of prayer walks around the high schools. One of the high schools we did a prayer walk around that same week, there was a young man who ended up getting caught with a gun in his bag. Now, the way he got caught was supernatural, and I believe it had to do with our prayer walk. The same week, if you read the story, they posted the story um, online about how they caught the young man. The young man was wandering around the classroom. This was at Broadneck High School, the, the high school that's actually close to this church. 
was wandering around acting kind of funny. And somebody noticed he was just being weird. So they said, um, do you need to go? we need to take you to the administration office. And he goes to the administration office, and it was either the principal or vice, prin vice principal was talking to him in their office. And the young man seemed kind of normal, right? They didn't know anything was wrong. But the man, I quote, said, the principal or vice pr principal said, he quoted in the paper, something told me to check his backpack. When the young man was about to turn around and leave, I feel the Holy Ghost. He was about to leave the principal's office, something. This man was not even necessarily a God-fearing man. But because some high schoolers decided to take dominion and pray and walk around the high school, something, we know who that something was, told the man to check the backpack. And he checked it. And he found the gun, and the kid got expelled, and there was no issues. Everybody was safe. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Yes. That's the type of stuff that happens when you supernaturally step out. These were high schoolers that prayed. The other time, there was another moment where um, I walked in that same high school, <laughs> and the administrator looked at me, and, and I said to him, I said, hey, we want to start a P7 here. He said, P7, what's that? I said, it's a Bible club. He goes, <laughs> Bible club. And I'm like, he goes, that, yeah, that's not going to happen. This was the man who was head of the clubs at this high school. And I looked at him. I said, why not? I didn't, I didn't go, oh, I'm sorry, brother. I looked him dead in the face and said, why not? And he, and he didn't really wasn't ready for my reaction. He was expecting me just to kind of cower away and be like, oh, oh, sorry, okay. I said, why can't we have a Bible club? He couldn't answer me because there was no reason why we couldn't. It's just he didn't want one. And he said, oh, 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 you know, stumbled around, almost sounded like he was talking to Tom. He didn't have an answer. I said, and he said, oh, yeah, I'll let you know. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I said, all right. For about three months, we began to pray. I'll never forget. I was in my house, and I couldn't sleep one night. And I began to pray, and God moved on me. And I specifically felt to speak and say, God, I pray in Jesus' name that whatever these resistance or wherever they're coming from, that, that administration, I said, I pray in Jesus' name you'd remove that man if he's not going to let us preach apostolic truth in that school. I pray in Jesus' name that you'd either fire him or send him somewhere else. Remove him if he's a blockade to people hearing the gospel. Mind you, this high school's had numerous suicides in the last few years. They want to know how are you going to change that? <laughs> Not what they're doing. It clearly doesn't work. They need the gospel. Literally, I got a phone call two to three days later. A young man, about 15, 16 years old, he calls me ecstatic. He's like, Brother Mike, you need to hear what happened. I said, what? He goes, you remember that guy that looked you in the face and said we never have a Bible club? I said, yeah. He goes, he just got sent to another school. <laughs> three days, to, within two to three days. The whole situation changed, and we had a P7. The question is, do you believe God is powerful, but we've got to learn how to hear his voice, speak his words. We've got to march around our school and pray, because any resistance, anything that gets in the way, the Lord can take care of it. He's very good at that. Amen. Praise God. Let's go to the next question. How can I help? A friend who's experienced a heavy loss, who has a hatred for God for what happened. How can I help a friend who's experienced a heavy loss, has a hatred for God? So we're talking about somebody has bitterness or offense towards God. Loss of a family member, I assume, or loss of something precious. Uh... I'm not sure if I could say I had bitterness towards God, but I had a sister who died when I was 10 years old. And there's a lot of questions um, that you have when you lose somebody close to you. And when you don't get answers to questions that you're seeking to have answered, you get frustrated. And if you get frustrated long enough, you get mad. 
You get mad long enough, you actually end up getting depressed. This is one of the patterns of the clinical, psychological process of depression. And that happened to me. Many times, while we try to focus on coming up with an answer as to why people, why somebody died or something was lost, an answer is not as powerful as peace is. I never got an answer as to why my sister died. But when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I got peace, I didn't need an answer anymore. So if you can be a conduit of peace for that individual by loving them, hearing out their frustration, and you not being a validating their frustration, you just sit there and love on them by providing an atmosphere of peace. If you have access to be able to spend time with them, say, God, I come as a messenger of peace in the name of Jesus. And just spend time with them. Uh, I've seen this in family, family members and friends. I'll say before I meet with them, I come in the name of Jesus Christ to be a messenger of peace. In fact, the Bible talks about the gospel being the glad tidings of peace. And so you can come as a messenger of peace by having an atmosphere of peace and help them to open up. Invite them over for dinner, lunch. Uh, it'll bring their guard down and love on them. Because while they, they, they'll probably look at you and say, you believe in God? Why, why did my so-and-so die? Don't try to be God. Just be a messenger of peace. And say, you know what? I don't know. But I know. And if you have the opportunity to say, but I, but I know peace is so important to have. And if you say it in the Holy Ghost with the love of God, they're going to feel peace come upon them and wash over them. So that's something you can do that I've seen work. Praise God. Anyone else? Have anything? Okay. Very good. It's amazing. You guys finally found the Q&A submissions. They'll just come in like crazy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow. They found the form. Praise God. Um, let's go to the next question. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure we. So next question. This will be a good. This is going to be a good one that will help some people. Dealing with, so we're dealing now with like uh, interpersonal issues between apostolics. So the question is, how do I deal with a friend who is a Christian but seems to be competing with me and sort of chasing me? Do I distance myself or do I talk to the person about it? So how do you deal with? competition amongst each other? Very good question. Uh, I was very good friend of mine. My, my, one of my best friends. It wasn't Brother Mike, but it was one of my best friends that's like a Brother Mike to me. It wouldn't matter if it was Brother Mike anyway, but uh, I was doing dishes in my apartment one day. My wife's not here. <laughs> I was doing dishes and uh, my best fr one of my best friends was coming into town to preach for the church I'm a part of. And I'm doing dishes, and all of a sudden this voice starts, this spirit starts speaking to me. You've been here for this amount of time, and all of a sudden he's coming out of nowhere and preaching in the service Sunday morning. And I'm doing dishes, I'm like, what? Yeah. They're just kicking you around until and using you, and all of a sudden they want to just come and use this guy out of nowhere for Sunday morning preaching. And I'm like, what is going on here? And I'm letting this voice speak to me long enough that my heart starts getting persuaded. And then I start saying, and then the Holy Ghost, I could feel the Holy Ghost looking at me, observing me for my response. And that night, I, I was, it was still chewing at my heart. And that night, the Holy Ghost came upon me and started giving me the unction to pray, 
Lord, I think so much of this young man. Lord, use him mightily tomorrow morning. God, let miracles, signs, and wonders be, th be done through his life tomorrow morning. And when I started praying that, I started having such relief in my spirit. Because while you can't control somebody competing with you, you can be submitted to the spirit of meekness and celebrate somebody else no matter what kind of motive they have. Meekness is thinking of others higher than you think of yourself. That doesn't mean you thinking of yourself like that. That means just taking responsibility to celebrate somebody else no matter what motive they have. And it's a test. I'm telling you right now, whoever submitted this question, you're in a test. And God is wanting to see what your response is going to be on whether or not you can celebrate somebody else because the disciples face the same thing. This guy's preaching your name and working miracles, healing people. We got to shut him down. And what did Jesus do? He rebuked them. He reproved them. He said, they can't, he, can't do it. he can't speak evil of my name if he's trying to compete with you. So if, he's ha if, if they, he or she, is having great success, you just praise God. And you get purified in the process. Because if it starts triggering your spirit, pass the test. Just repent. Give it to God. I'm not going to compete, Lord. But you keep doing the will of God. And if God gives you great success and this person thinks you're competing with them, just... Stay humble, celebrate others, uh, let God take care of it, and pray for them. Pray If you really feel and have discerned that it's the spirit of competition, pray for them. Love on them. Don't, don't pick up that same spirit. Very good. I'm just going to insert this really quick. The Bible says if you compare yourself amongst yourself, you're not wise. Here's why. If you compare yourself with somebody and you feel like you're better than them, you've just fallen into pride. If you compare yourself to somebody and you feel like you're less than them, you've fallen into insecurity. You can't win with comparison. You always lose. Don't compare yourself to others. Compare yourself to the Word of God. Amen. Um, we've got three, three questions. <laughs> wow. I knew that. Did that you, Dylan Nelson? Yeah, I knew it. Somebody said, what's your baby's name going to be? I just saw it pop up. <laughs> that will be a revelation one day when she comes. Okay, three more questions. Uh, this one's really good. I want to toss this to Hector first, and then you guys, if you feel to tag, tag along. It says, is it possible to have a temporary calling, like God wants you to do something for a certain amount of time, before he calls you to your main calling and the intention he has for your life? This is a very good question. So is it possible to be involved with other ministries or callings before fulfilling your ultimate calling? Very good question. So we have an eternal calling, and that's to be a child of God, a worshiper of the Lord. Um, your ultimate calling... And whose agenda? Is it your agenda or the Lord's agenda? Ask Jesus. Hey, Jesus, what was your ultimate calling? Well, for 30 years, it could have very well been that his father was not around, Joseph. And he was working in a carpenter shop, serving his family, giving, making, having a provision for his family. Uh, being a leader for his siblings, half-siblings. That was very crucial to the development of Christ's character in order for him to be able to have the right character with the ministry that God was manifesting openly for the three and a half years. I say that because if you get too fixated on what's in the future, you will miss out on what God is wanting to do in the present. I did not 
have great aspirations to be used in a translation ministry. Not because I had anything against it, but because I just, it never really crossed my mind. But I've been able to translate for men of God that are very well known in this movement. And because I submitted myself to something that I'd never really had a personal passion for, I've actually been able to catch some of their gifting. And so you don't know what the Lord's doing in the spirit by submitting yourself to a ministry that you may not feel is your ultimate calling. Ask yourself, can God be, glor can God be glorified in this and is God calling me to do this? If you have peace about it, even if your pastor's asking you to do it, I don't know why you're asking this question. And so you don't know how the Lord is shaping you and preparing you for something that's coming in the future. Don't try to get ahead of your God or get ahead of yourself. Serve. See, if you're humble, if you're humble, or you seek a place of prayer to become humble, uh, it won't matter if it's a part of your ultimate calling. I'm very passionate about what's been going on this week, but there's been a lot of things that I've done behind scenes by the grace of God in that in God's economy prepared me. But I, I stopped trying to figure out the Lord and what he was doing too much. I just, I'm thankful for what he reveals to me. And I just run with it. But just let the Lord shape you and form you. He'll take care of the ultimate calling things. You, you just let him prepare you. The one thing you can focus on is preparation. Don't force yourself into the ultimate calling. Please don't. We don't need people that are unprepared. But what you can do is let the Lord prepare you where you're at for you to be ready when it comes. Because when someday becomes today, as uh, Bishop Wright talks about, when someday becomes today, are you going to be ready for that? You don't just sit around and wait for the ultimate call. I think that's all I got. That, that was amazing. Just to tag off of it, um, I think something that has to happen, is, and it's an impossibility for you to think to yourself, or be thinking about the ultimate calling and be 100% faithful to where you are now. A part of your mind is already there. You're already trying to get there. You're trying to be there. You're trying to do the things that are things that you feel like will prepare you for that thing. You've got to submit that to your leader, your leadership. The number one thing that has saved me because my mind there's all, you're human. There's going to be thoughts. There's going to be aspirations. There's going to be dreams. They cannot remain unsubmitted, though, because they're going to grow and grow and grow, and they're going to corrupt anything else you're trying to do right, where God has you right now. So you got to submit that. Yeah. And, and the reason being, and, and when I speak about corrupting things, if you look in the book of Revelation at the church of Laodicea, the Lord talks about that church being lukewarm, and he spits them out of their mouth, out of his mouth. In, in, if you look at the geography of over there, they have streams. They have hot streams and cold streams. Their cold streams were for drinking water and things like that. Their hot streams were for bathing, for washing clothes, things like that. Each side, a lot of times we think that hot, cold meant in church, hot, cold is out of church. It was the hot stream had a purpose. Yeah. The cold stream had a purpose. Yeah. The lukewarm was when the hot stream and the cold stream, the cold started trying to be hot and the hot started trying to be cold and they ended up lukewarm. Yeah. If yeah. God has you here and your mind is there, you're going to be looking there and not, you're not, not going to be used to the, your fullest potential in either. Yeah. When the cold stream that's used for, for drinking wants to be the hot stream used for cleaning clothes and bathing, it's now useless for, clean, for drinking because it's not cold anymore, but it's useless for bathing because it's not hot anymore. It's lukewarm. So if, you're, if God has you here and you're thinking there, you're not going to give your all here, so you're not going to be fully effective. But you're not, it's not ready, it's not time for you to be there yet, so you're not going to be fully effective. Yeah. 
so you've, it is so crucial and important that you submit whatever's there to God, to your pastor, to God, and ca- just cast that and give everything you have. If God's calling you to be the cold stream right now, be the cold stream because somebody needs to drink some water. And if God's calling you to be the hot stream right now, be the hot stream. It, it, everything has a purpose. Yeah. So where you are right now isn't something to just step over. There's a purpose yeah. in that. There is a very specific purpose in that. Very good. The, I just add this really quick. I'm talking about seasons very fast. Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a time and a purpose under heaven for everything. The Bible says that everything is beautiful in its time. The thing is that this is the revelation you have to understand. Every season you're in has a purpose. God's trying to bring a purpose out of you. When you focus on the next season, rather than giving yourself to this season, the ironic thing is you have just hindered that season because this season prepares you for that season. So what happens is when you focus on the future, you hinder your future. The way you walk in wisdom is you submit and die out and stop trying to figure out what God's doing in the season and just let the season have its work. And that will produce the purpose in you and make everything beautiful. Want to wonder why your seasons aren't beautiful? Because you're trying to figure it out and you're not submitting to the season God has you in. Your season becomes beautiful when you submit to it and let God do what he wants to do in you and produce the purpose he wants. Everything is beautiful in its time. Amen? We have three questions left, and we only have about 10 minutes, so we got to go through these quick. Um, How do you balance school, CMI, work, and prevent burnout burnout in ministry, school, and family? So basically, how do you balance and not burn out when you're involved with so many different things? This is a great question, one that a lot of you need. Nate, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, It just comes down to to priority. Um, I know a lot probably too much about spreading yourself really thin (laughs) and uh, trying to accomplish, you know, everything all at once. Um, But, you know, there just has to be a priority. In high school, doing P7, uh, and as well in college, uh, I was a student athlete in high school and in college as well. And, you know, my coaches knew that the Bible club, it comes before practice. It comes before everything else. I didn't try to do both and be in two places at once, Um, but you have to have your priorities. Um, So if you do have a family, you know, uh, family (laughs) is, is that's that's the priority, you know, your own house, Um, you know, and your ministry and serving God, you know, that's, you know, that's our life force. That's what we're giving while we have breath in our lungs. Um, and, you know, and it goes down from there. But God will bless. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right, and his righteousness, and everything will be added unto you. He's worked out so many things for, I mean, little, little things that don't even make sense. I remember being in college, and I oversleep a little bit. I'm like, oh, I got to head straight to class. And God's like, you going to leave me hanging? Like, this is that one professor that's like, if you're late, don't even bother coming. And I'm um, like, oh, you know, I got to keep God first. And so I took the time to, to pray, not like, all right, God, I love you so much. Bless my day. Amen. Like, to actually pray. And I walk across campus, and I get there, and the professor is more late than I am. And I'm good. Like, so many little things happen. When you put God first, he'll take care of the rest, but just make sure he's first, and you're not running around to please man, you're not running around to, you know, uh, just fulfill obligations, obligations, but you're truly keeping God first. Really quick, if truly examine your schedule, the amount of hours you're working, the classes you're taking, the people you're hanging out with, are you staying up watching TV? Are you staying up scrolling on social media? Are you drinking too much coffee? 
Are you eating junk food and it's keeping you up or you can't wake up and get out of bed in the morning? Come on now. You got to be honest with yourself about how much time you think you don't have. And so much more, it's so much more easier to cast out a devil than it is to submit the flesh. And so ask yourself, Am I really as busy as I think I am? Because in five years, you'll realize, man, I really wasn't busy five years ago. That's so true. When a high school looks at me and goes, I'm so busy, I literally just, I just shake my head. I don't even say anything. I just go, literally, that's my reaction. <laughs> Little junior in high school gets off of school at 1.30, doesn't have to work. Brother Mike, I'm so busy. I know you guys are busy. I'm sorry. Um, the only thing I'll say to that to add on really quick is that I think a lot of times we get burnt out because we compartmentalize God and school. And when I say compartmentalize, I mean we put school here, ministry here, family, friends here. That's not how God's kingdom works. It all goes together. While you're in school, you're looking to minister. While you're doing your homework, your spirit's open to pray with somebody. You won't be burnt out as much if you actually let God be a part of everything you're doing. Amen. How can I help someone who used to be a Christian but now says she's a non-binary and an atheist? Before they say anything, I'll say this because I've been looking at this question. I've been thinking about it. That person has an offense. They are offended with God. You do not just become an atheist because you think it's a good idea. You become an atheist because you're offended with the way your life went or somebody died. Listen, guys, nobody is an atheist just because they choose to believe God doesn't exist. People become atheists because they don't want God to exist because they're mad at the way their life went. That you don't you're not born an atheist. You become an atheist or you choose to become an atheist because you don't want to believe God exists. Because you don't, you can't bear the fact of what how things happen to you. This whole gender issue and confusion—it's all—all all of it really is tied to confusion, and confusion is a product of an offense and bitterness. So we need to focus more on dealing with people's hurt than telling people to stop dressing a certain way or start thinking a certain way or God exists. You go up to somebody who's an atheist and you tell them, God's real, you're wrong. That's not going to work. They're going to be like, okay, I disagree with you. But you go up to somebody and say, have you ever had any traumatic experiences in your life? How, how have things gone in your life? Like, how's your family? You start finding out you can get to the root. Somebody died. They were hurt. They were molested. They were raped. Something happened which caused them in their mind to block God out because of their offense. If we can get people's hearts to be healed, they would start to love God again. Really quick, that's the offense portion. The defense portion is this. Do not get yoked up with an unbeliever. You do not want, while you're being offensive, by offensive I mean you're having spiritual offense and helping minister to that soul. While you're doing that, you don't want to get sideswiped and influenced by them. Continue to remain the one who's influencing yes. and not become the one who's being influenced. Very good. And so remember to guard yourself, partner up with somebody, be accountable to somebody. Hey, I'm being connected with this person. Let's pray together for them so I can be effective. The only thing I'll say, minister to your friend. Do not preach to your friend. There's a very big difference there. You preach at your friend, you preach to your friend, those walls are going to be up. When you minister to your friend, ministering to your friend may just look like going out to have lunch with them. Ministering to your friend may just be giving them some love. Ministering to your friend may just be being there. Because, you see, while you're ministering to them, you'll get a really good feel of where their spirit's at the Lord will start kind of showing you some things if you're open. If you make sure you're open and you're, you're in tune with God's spirit while you're sitting there just talking to them, because when you're preaching with them, their guard is up. When you're, when you're ministering and just talking to them, their guard is down. They're wide open because they're, uh, the question said it's their friend, right? It's your friend. 
They trust you. They're open. So while they're open, ask God to start revealing things to you, and then it'll give you some specific things to then take to God in prayer. But when you go in there and just say, what is wrong with you? You were just here, and now you're there. Why, would you, why do you think that's a good idea? What's this? What's that? Walls up. Trust is gone. You're not going to feel anything from that. You're going to get nothing but a brick wall. Every time you try to minister to them, nothing. Every time you try to talk to them, nothing. But if you just minister, just talk with them, love them, be their friend, just be there, God will just start, you'll start pinging things. You'll just start feeling stuff. You'll feel, oh, man, that's, that's depression. That's hurt. That's, that's offense. That's bitterness. That's this. That's that. I now know what I need to be taking to God because you can't fix that. Only God can. We already said that in that one of the other questions. This battle is not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual thing, and you can't fix that. So you, once you start pinging things, you now know, okay, what can I take to the throne? What can I take to God? Amen. Praise God. We got one last one, and this is going to be a faith booster. This is actually really exciting. And I think I might go first so you guys can think about it real quick. We don't have to all do it, just if you feel to. The last question. What is your craziest miracle or CMI story that happened while you were on campus or P7? And I'll say real quick for me, I was at the University of Maryland. Our group was praying, uh, praying in the, in the lecture hall right before we had service, meaning a CMI service. And uh, the spirit of the Lord was moving on us so strong we felt to keep praying. <laughs> and people started walking in. Guests were coming in and, you know, we're praying. I mean, really going after it. And I'm like, Lord, what in the world? These people think we're crazy. But I just kept feeling like we can't stop. Like God's moving and something's happening. Well, all of a sudden, the Lord just started putting in my heart, just, just preach about the Holy Ghost. And we had a bunch of guests there. We're at the University of Maryland in a lecture hall. And uh, I said, okay. So I started to preach about the Holy Ghost. And one girl, while I'm talking, I had literally not preached more than 10 to 15 minutes. She goes, can I have the Holy Ghost? And I'm like, man. It only happened like this every time. Come on down. <laughs> Felt like a game show. Come on down. She comes down. She lifts her hands. She gets filled with the Holy Ghost in seconds right there in front of everybody in the middle of the preaching. But hold on. That's not the coolest part. That's a cool part. She gets the Holy Ghost. And then another girl goes, I want the Holy Ghost too. She comes up front. She begins to pray. All of a sudden, she literally bends over, and she's, she's bent over, and she's like, something's wrong. And we're like, what's going on? She's like, something's in my stomach. I went, oh, Lord, she got a devil. She did. She had a devil. She, had a, she literally was demon-possessed. And I'm like, I've never been in this situation before. <laughs> I'm still a college student. You know, I've heard about people casting out devils, but I'm like, all right, Lord. I'm like, well, I just prayed and fasted recently, so hope, hopefully uh, I'm prepared. The Lord says, some go out by prayer and fasting. <laughs> so that's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, some go out by prayer and fasting. And literally, I felt my, my hands start feeling tingly or hot. It was God telling me, I'm about to give you dominion over this thing. She's about to get delivered. So I, sto I stopped her. I said, come here. I said, you have a devil. I said, you have a spirit. It's connected to the generational spirit. She was from Africa, and her, whole, her family was connected to witchcraft in a bunch of different ways. I said, you've got a generational spirit here, and you're about to get delivered. We're going to pray. We're going to command this devil to leave you, and you'll be filled with the gifts of the Holy Ghost. She lifted her hands. I lie not. We said, in Jesus' name, we command you to be free. As soon as I put my hand on her head, that thing left, and she began to speak with tongues, and we went nuts. The whole place exploded. We were running, screaming, yelling, losing our mind. In a lecture hall, one girl gets the Holy Ghost, and another girl gets a devil cast out and gets the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Praise God. That was an awesome experience. Real quick, I was helping do some campus evangelism for, uh, with the campus ministry, and we were, doing, uh, we were walking around praying for people to be healed. And there was this one guy that he had, I don't even remember what the name of his sickness was, but he had... He could not feel, if you touched his body, he could not feel it. He, could not, he, did, he couldn't detect where you were touching him. Um, he couldn't detect it. In fact, I didn't know, but from a medical professional, they ended up telling me that it was a form of paralysis. And so we, uh, we prayed for him, and uh, I said, all right, let's test it. 
so I hit him. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, uh, he, and I was hitting him before, and he wasn't, bu- like, he legit wasn't budging. Like, he didn't know where I was hitting him or anything. He wasn't bluffing, too, because he, he, he was like, ow! <laughs> and I said, praise God, he's healed! Praise God! <laughs> but uh, that's a good story. Um, I, I, they're, they're two quick ones, so they're just in equal. I just don't, can't pick one. So, Old Mill High School, the, the Lord had just started. I had a, I had an issue with feeling like God couldn't use me and the gifts of the Spirit yet. I felt like I was too young or something. I just, I don't know why I felt that. I just felt it. And I thought, man, he'll use Brother Mike, he'll use all these people, but just not me. And so, God instructed me to teach a lesson on miracles, and, and, and that miracles, Hap, miracles work, I think was what it was called. And I'm fr- I'm fresh, and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just saying the verses God told me to read. And this kid walks up to me, and he says, well, you just talked about miracles, and you said that if we pray that God will do anything and it'll happen. And I was like, yeah, I, d- I did. <laughs> and I did say that. <laughs> I did. And, and this gets a point where can you practice what you preach? So I'm like, uh, all right. So he's like, can you pray for me? And I'm thinking, because in, in the schools here, you're not allowed to lay hands on people. So I was like, yeah, but let me ask the administration. So I was scared. I didn't think that God could use me in the miraculous. And so I asked the administration thinking they're going to say, absolutely not. You can't lay hands on him. And this dude looks at me and says, absolutely. Go head out in the hallway. <laughs> so <laughs> um, now my heart is like, dude, 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 dude. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what are we getting ready to do? And we go out in the hallway, and he, he, the, 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 uh, he had brain surgery, and the doctor messed up. His hand was stuck like this. He could move his fingers a little bit, but not his thumb at all. It was just kind of stuck like this. And I literally, I, I put my hand on his shoulder, I'm pretty sure, and I'm stuttering. I was just, I was just talking to Bianca about this. It was the most just, te- it was, a, if, if you could rank prayer, it was not a good prayer. I was like, God, um... Uh, uh, to uh, reconnect the, the brain to the hand and the nerves and let it just reconnect and let there be motion. I'm, but I, look, my motive was pure. I was like, man, God, you said anything we asked. So I was like, God, so, you know, heal his hand. And before I say amen, I peek open to look down so I could see what happened before I tell him to open his eyes. And I peek and look. And I said, Lord, I have faith, but just help me for the unbelief. And I, I look down and his hand's opening up. And I said, Look, 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 look. So I'm more excited than he is. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So God healed his hand right then and there, and he's looking at me like, oh, my goodness, my hand. And I'm looking at him like, oh, my goodness, your hand. <laughs> and the, the second one really quickly was, and, and this, I just want to build faith because the, I think sometimes when we're in high school, we feel like we're too young for God, and even middle school, we're too young for God to work in the gifts and all that stuff. But I was teaching this lesson, and literally the Lord put five faces like they were hovering over the crowd as I'm talking and I was trying to ignore it I was slipped I was stumbling over my words because I'm like what am I seeing did I not get enough sleep last night what did they put in the school food today what is going on and these faces they're in the club and they're just hovering over there and I'm talking about the love of God and stuff and I didn't know why they were there and literally at the very end those five faces the people came up to me one at a time and said, I know that you don't know it, but literally you were speaking exactly to what I was dealing with this morning, exactly what I was dealing with last night. Exact, and I'm sitting here, listen, I did not feel like God could use me in the gifts of the Spirit. And it was like, you're lying to me. You're, you're just saying that to be nice. And like, no, I kid you not, tears running down their face. I was just getting ready to commit suicide. I was just struggling with depression. I was just feeling like nobody loved me. And so God was just using me in the gifts of, of the Spirit. That's not me. It's just me being a conduit for God's Spirit to flow through. So that I just wanted to build faith in there that God will use. It's not about experience level. It's not about intellectual knowledge level. Just be there. Be open and available, and God will do it. That's incredible. I, I, uh, it's, I, I agree it's, it's difficult to pick one, but just to give you just a, a little o- a brief overview. Uh, when I just got to college my freshman year, I, mind you, I'm coming from high school. Everybody knows I'm a Christian. I live for God. We have a Bible club during the summers. We have, uh, li- like, the people in my neighborhood come together and we're having Bible studies in my basement. Daryl Bond, actually, he's 
one of the guys from that Bible study. And uh, so college, I'm like, I'm going to play it low key. Yes, the P7 coordinator was like, nobody knows my history. Nobody knows I'm a Christian. Nobody knows anything about me. It's a blank slate. I'm just going to chill. Um, and God did not allow that to happen at all. Um, and the way he got me out was one of my sweet mates came in the room. He's like, oh, I don't know what's going on. I just feel so empty. I'm like, oh, don't tell me that. Because you know we have the answer. He's like, yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm like, I'm missing something. I'm like, no, stop talking right now. I don't want to hear this. Because once you you speak, you know, what, the word of God, then you are establishing yourself as set apart. And so you can't fly, fly uh, incognito anymore. So, but you can't. Also, when the Holy Ghost is in, you can't not respond to hunger. When somebody's around you that's hungry for God and needing God, and you got the Holy Ghost in you, the Holy Ghost will express itself with you or without your help. And so, uh, long story short, we ended up starting a Bible study that ended up growing to literally the, the entire track team. People were coming from multiple dorms into this Bible study. Um, and then we were to change rooms again to like 30 people and 50 people. And it was, and God was doing amazing. There were countless, at least, probably not countless, because it wasn't more than 20. But some were in the teens that ended up receiving the Holy Ghost. Uh, that particular guy ended up uh, saying, I have to be baptized. No, no, you don't understand. Like, he got the revelation of John 3, 5. He's like, I've got to be baptized, like, now. The only thing we could find was a, a old, rusted out soaking tub for athletes. And uh, we started filling it up with water, and things started floating in the water, and he didn't care. He just wanted to get in the water and be covered in the name of <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and and it, it, was, it was absolutely incredible. We saw countless just people constantly coming in and all the, all the years that I was there. People were being filled with the Holy Ghost and being baptized, and, and it's incredible. And then I stepped off campus to study abroad, and that's when I really saw the mighty hand of God. Uh, I ended up having a Bible study with two guys, uh, and a lot of homeless people were there in uh, Costa Rica. And uh, a crippled guy came up to us as well, and he had a, a scar on his wrist, and he said he can't open. So he had begged for some money, and uh, the guy I was teaching the Bible study to was like, hey, uh, don't bother us. Uh, if, if God heals your hand, if we, if we pray and God heals your hand, will you just go get a job? And <laughs> I was like, I guess we can deal with it that way. <laughs> wow. And so we prayed, and God <laughs> opened up his hand miraculously. Um, and after that, it was on. I mean, they were, we had so many drug addicts. They had a huge wow. drug problem. And the more people that came and got completely delivered, the next week they would come back, and they were, it was a little park right there near the beach. I mean, it was just so many people just off the streets were coming in, being delivered, then getting their friends and bringing more people being delivered. And then uh, I shared with P7, uh, the other uh, scenario that happened was uh, we got called to another t a neighboring town because they heard like all this stuff going on. Wow. And there was a young man, 21, who had to drop out of school and everything. He had, was in the wrong place, wrong time, and got shot, and the fragment of the bullet lodged in his skull. They couldn't operate on it because it was too close to his brain and it would cause brain damage, which would uh, cause him to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. So they didn't operate. Um, anyway, long story short, we prayed, and the bullet moved in his skull all the way to the back of his neck. He went to a uh, couple days that didn't happen instantaneously. I, I wasn't watching the bullet. And I was like, <gasps> um, <laughs> but it happened a couple days after uh, he ended up going to the hospital. And when they took the x-ray, they saw that it had moved um, and they could operate. And he was completely healed. But I've seen God do the supernatural Amen. in so Hallelujah. many ways. It's just incredible. Can we give a God a hand clap for all these awesome stories? Do you believe God's going to do it for you too? Amen. I believe that God is going to do these stories for us too in Jesus' name.